Great Lakes Prepping here. A few years ago I started getting interested in amateur radio as many preppers tend to do and as many ham radio newbies do I started off by getting one of these cheap Baofeng walkie talkie radios to sort of start getting familiar with the basics while learning and studying to get my amateur radio license. A couple months later I took the test and got my technician class license. Since then my interest level has gone up and down and is the case with many of the things I dabble in, the amount of time I spend working with it and practicing ham radio communications has its peaks and valleys. A couple months ago, I came across some YouTube videos featuring these home-built systems that are sometimes referred to as a ham radio go box. Basically, a ham radio go box is a self-contained portable radio setup. The idea is that you can grab it and go and easily deploy it anywhere. They generally involve uh, mobile radios that are more powerful than a walkie-talkie, uh, like the kind that you see installed in a vehicle, and uh, they also tend to feature a much larger battery than a walkie-talkie. After watching a couple dozen videos and browsing a number of websites over the course of a few weeks, seeing the varying styles and configurations that people have come up with, I was pretty intrigued. I saw no other course of action than to build one of my own. I will say, out of all the videos I watched and all the pictures I looked at, I liked the style and simplicity of the one built by YouTube user DogGirl211. Her go box was sort of the inspiration for how I came up with mine. Hers ended up being a bit more of a starting point, since by the end of it I ended up with something a bit more elaborate. Nevertheless, credit due to the person who inspired me, and that person is DogGirl211. To talk a little more about what makes up a go box, you pretty much need three ingredients to use a mobile ham radio. The radio itself, an antenna, and a battery. Everything else is basically parts and accessories that incorporate those three ingredients into a handy presentation. I could have thrown a radio and battery into any old bag or box and called it a day, but that isn't quite my style. I tend to work under the mantra of, if it's worth doing, it's worth taking to a ridiculous and borderline unnecessary level. I started off by imagining everything I wanted my box to include. Most of these ideas came from looking at dozens of other people's go boxes and picking and choosing which components I liked. Next I had to figure out how many of those components would actually fit and be feasible in a box of a reasonable size. I really liked the Nanook hard shell case that Dog Girl 211 used, but I ended up getting the taller version of the one she used because I wanted my battery and all the wiring to be hidden beneath the main control panel. So I went with the Nanook 908 case. A little something about the Nanook cases. They are very high quality and I can't say enough good things about them. I also like that they're generally quite a bit cheaper than the Pelican cases. The Nanook 908 case that I bought was just the right dimensions for what I wanted to do and it came with screw holes that would allow me to attach my control panel flush with the box's opening. An optional Lexan panel can also be purchased for use with this box. I didn't want to use a transparent panel, which the Lexan panel is, but I bought it anyway so I could use it as a template for the mounting screw holes. I spent some time finding a radio that I liked. It seems that most of the mobile radios of this size are sort of Chinese cheapo brands. I ended up going with the Anytone AT778UV dual band radio. After I decided on the box I wanted and narrowed down my list of features to those that would actually fit in the box, I began designing the layout. As I've mentioned in the past, I'm not especially skilled in 3D or CAD design, so I tend to design everything in 2D from multiple angles. Though I'm sure there are much better software tools for blueprinting 2D designs, I'm very comfortable with Adobe Illustrator, so that's what I use. After figuring out the rough placement of everything, I went ahead and purchased all of the components that I was able to at this point. This included the radio, battery, power switch, voltage meter, USB ports, power pull outlet for charging, antenna bulkhead, fuse holder, and small cooling fan. I also wanted to have a small storage compartment that would take advantage of some empty space in the box, but I could not find any such product. So I enlisted the help of a CAD designer I know, and he designed a compartment for me. I then had it printed by Shapeways. If you're not familiar with them, Shapeways is a 3D print on demand company. You send them a CAD file, pick the material you want, some other options, and a couple weeks later they mail you a professionally printed part. I also had to figure out how to mount the radio in a way that wouldn't wobble or wiggle around. So I designed a small triangular bracket. 
I had this also done up as a CAD file and printed by Shapeways. It worked perfectly. Now that I had all the components in hand, I could measure everything very precisely and refine my 2D design for the main control panel. My idea was to have a piece of acrylic laser cut with the exact dimensions and cutouts of where everything was to be mounted. I don't trust my router and jigsaw skills with this particular job, and I wanted it to come out very nice and professional looking. After a few rounds of adjusting my cutouts, printing the layout on paper, trimming everything with an X-Acto blade, and seeing how my components fit, I was ready to have the panel cut. An acquaintance of mine has a Glowforge laser cutting machine, so I got some matte finish acrylic and he cut my panel for me. I'm really happy with how the acrylic panel came out. I think the matte finish looks great. But the panel turned out to be a little too flexible. Once I mounted the radio and everything else to it, it wanted to sag a bit. I thought about having a second piece printed and doubling them up, but I don't think the box's lip edge is tall enough to accommodate for that. So even though I really liked the acrylic piece, my next idea was to have a new panel cut out of aluminum. There are several online companies that do on-demand laser cutting. I ended up going with a company called Send Cut Send. For around $30, they took my 2D vector artwork and cut out a 3mm aluminum panel. I'm very happy with their work. Now, my only problem is that I wanted the panel to be black in color. For aluminum, my options are pretty much paint it or have it anodized. Anodization is the process used to dye aluminum different colors. It's very effective and involves using electricity and acid to alter the surface of the aluminum in a way that allows it to absorb dye. I really wanted to use this option, but my one little piece wasn't really worth the average anodizing company's time, so it would have ended up costing a bit too much, probably around $100 according to the couple of quotes I got, just for the one piece. I even looked into getting the equipment and materials to anodize it myself at home, but of course that would have ended up costing well over the hundred dollars. Anyway, I ended up opting to paint it. For the best results when spray painting aluminum, you need to rough up the surface with some sandpaper and then use something called self-etching primer. Then I painted it with a matte black and finally sealed it with a transparent matte clear coat spray. I'm pretty happy with how it looks after painting, but I just knew I'd end up nicking and scratching it during the process of assembling everything. It's not super noticeable, but I absolutely ended up nicking and scratching it in a few places. Aside from the panel, the other main challenge I had was to figure out how to mount the battery to the box. Though I could have used a smaller battery, I opted for a 12 amp hour battery. When I laid everything out on the computer, there was plenty of room for everything. What I hadn't accounted for though, was the rounded corners inside the box. Because of the rounded corners, my rectangular battery would not sit tightly against the floor and walls. I needed to attach it securely because I certainly don't want this big heavy thing tumbling around and smashing everything inside the box. So my solution was to raise the battery up slightly above the rounded corner. I also had to figure out how exactly to attach the battery. I really wanted to avoid drilling any holes in this box as these Nanook boxes are 100% watertight when closed, but I didn't have confidence in trying to glue something this heavy to this type of plastic so I ended up having to drill a single hole in the back of the box. I found a battery bracket from a company that sells ice fishing accessories and it was almost a perfect fit. I did have to do a little modification with my Dremel so there would be room for that 3D printed compartment. Using epoxy I attached two small pieces of PVC pipe to the bottom of the box so the battery and bracket would sit atop them thereby raising the battery above the level of the rounded corner on the bottom of the box. Then I used a single bolt and wing nut to affix the battery mount to the back of the box. Even there's only this single bolt and nut holding the heavy, heavy battery in place, it's very sturdy and doesn't move around at all when I shake or flip the box around. So after attaching all the components to the aluminum panel, I got to work on the wiring. I knew how I wanted to wire everything, but I somewhat underestimated how much space all of the wires and terminals and stuff would take up inside the box. I used some heavy duty Velcro tape to place the terminals in strategic out of the way places and routed the wires the best I could so they wouldn't all be bunched up and get in the way when putting the panel in place. Earlier I mentioned that I had planned for a small cooling fan to be installed in the panel. Once I started assembling and testing everything, I changed my mind. 
The fan already wasn't especially necessary, but I thought it would look cool. Uh, once the radio was installed, I realized that I had a hard time hearing the speaker since the speaker is in the part of the radio that's now beneath the panel. Fortunately, the radio has a jack in the back for headphones or an auxiliary speaker. I was also lucky that they make small speakers that have the exact same outer dimensions and screw hole placement as the PC fan on which I based the cutouts in the panel. I decided to keep the wire fan grill as the speaker grill because, again, I thought it looked cool. So, here are a few miscellaneous observations from having built this thing. 1. I probably should have gone with the 7 amp hour battery instead of the 12. The 7 amp hour battery is shorter and this would have saved me some headaches. Because I hadn't originally accounted for having to raise the battery up a bit to clear that rounded corner, all of the wiring for my panel components were kind of smashing into the top of the battery. The panel didn't set into place nice and crisp and clean. I had to press it down just a bit as I put the screws in because it was compressing all the wires and stuff just slightly. I don't think it'll be a problem, but I fixate on little things like this because it doesn't feel like a quote clean install. I'll always wonder if squishing things into place that little bit will cause something to fail sometime in the future. And in fact, I may still end up changing the battery out for the shorter one. Number two, I will also always be annoyed by the few nicks and scratches in my painted aluminum panel. I may still end up getting a new panel cut and having it anodized, but I really shouldn't because that's just wasting money at this point. Three, I originally had a different power switch. Rather than a small blue LED and a black switch, I had a switch where the entire thing was itself illuminated blue. I really liked how this looks, except the light ended up being so darn bright I could hardly stand to look in the general direction of the radio or anything else. So I changed it out for this other switch. It doesn't look as cool, but now I can actually use the thing without wearing sunglasses. Number four, the one thing that I was not able to accomplish that I really wanted was a storage solution for the top of the box. I had plans for an elastic and mesh storage pouch that would attach to the inside of the lid and I would use it to store the radio's microphone when not in use. I had everything designed, all the materials bought, and I was ready to go. But after installing all of the lower components, I realized there was simply no room. As it is now, the microphone barely fits in a way that allows me to close the lid. I have to arrange the microphone and its cord just right on the panel so I can close the lid without squishing it. This has ended up being my least favorite thing about the box. If that lid was another half inch taller, I'd be much happier. So that's about it. A lot went into making this thing, and it's very possible that I've missed something or forgot to talk about some part of it. Despite some frustrations, I had a lot of fun building it, and I learned a lot. And of course, my wheels are already turning on a second, new and improved version of it. We'll see. My wallet really needs some R&R &R after this project. Anyway, I'll list as many of the components as I can below in case you want to build something similar. Obviously, the custom printed parts can't just be purchased from Amazon or something, but I may make the artwork files available in some form if anybody's interested. So I hope you enjoyed seeing my custom ham radio go box. Let me know what you think in the comments. And until next time, this is Great Lakes Prepping.